Hey, this is Mark in San Antonio, Texas. I love the Gospel Tangents podcast because it has some of the best and most diverse guests in the field of Mormon studies. They're people whose work I've read and enjoyed and that I would love to sit down and have a chat with. And the podcast lets me have that experience vicariously. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. The modern LDS church has not officially practiced polygamy for 130 years. However, Lindsay Hansen Park, host of Year of Polygamy, says that the polygamy continues to shape the modern LDS church. Why does she say that? Check out her conversation. I really appreciate you uh, talking to me for so long. Um, is there any last things? Whoa, I've got a nice dog here. I'm not a dog person, do you know that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not either. I got stuck with them. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, is there any, any last thoughts you want to close up with here? on? I would just say I would encourage people, I mean, plug for the podcast. You can, if you want to hear all the details and the dates, because, it, again, it's been a few years since I've covered all of this, so accuracy, historical accuracy is super important to me. And so go, go look at these up. I encourage everyone to look at these stories. Look at the evidence and the documents yourself. Come up with your own conclusions, because you're hearing my conclusions based on my experiences with it. And if there's one thing I know about Mormonism is that it's open for interpretation because <laughs> I've certainly learned that. And the other thing I would say is stop ignoring these communities. Stop stop participating in the marginalization, especially, I mean, this is a call to scholars. You should know better. You know, there's still, I always say this, that you'll understand LDS Mormonism and Mormonism in general if you understand that faith, the word faith, is actually interchangeable with the word loyalty to the institution. And once you understand that, you understand why nobody cares what you believe or don't believe. You can go to a ward house and be doubting Joseph Smith and nobody cares, but if you talk about it, then we have a problem with it. So loyalty is an issue, and so I see that it's pervasive in the Mormon studies community, in the fields in which I work. People are so uncomfortable with admitting that we're similar. I mean, we even have, they sent Richard Bushman and Brian Hales up to a, uh, in Canada for a case with Winston um, Blackmore. Oh, to, yeah, he talked about that on my podcast, Brian. Yeah, yeah. To, to say that they weren't practicing Mormonism. And I just think it's absurd. Like the, who, who, who wanted, so somebody wanted Brian and, and Richard Bushman to say... To say that the, that the doctrines that were being practiced by the FLDS and... The Bountiful group in Bountiful weren't Mormon doctrine. Who was this? The prosecutors in Canada, or yeah, yeah, that's what they wanted. They were uh, did they say special that? witnesses. Yeah, they did. Oh. And this is this is very common in the historical community. They're like, yeah, yeah, fundamentalism is interesting, but it's not Mormonism. It's like, no, 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 it it absolutely is, and it's irresponsible and frankly unsophisticated. I think to look at Mormonism, LDS Mormonism, as a static religion that's not impacted by these groups because it is. Now, of course, it's so hard to track. There, Like I said, there's always like two guys in an alternate living room all the time. But these people are influencing our policies. They're influencing how we view ourselves. They're influencing how we market ourselves and brand ourselves. A lot of the marketing and branding of the LDS Church has been an attempt to distance ourselves from this. And scholars are so entrenched in that narrative, they're still so loyal to the institution of Mormonism. It's only non-Mormon scholars who are able to like be like, of course this is all the same thing. But we have so much generational propaganda and campaigns to distance ourselves that scholars fall into this trap all the time. We're uncomfortable with it. And so by distancing ourselves from it creates the environment in which Warren Jeffs can be such a That predator. is my belief, yes. And, uh, you know, reasonable people can disagree with that. I would just say, based on my experiences and talking to fundamentalists, the majority of fundamentalists will say that the worst persecution that they've experienced, the worst abuse from outsiders, has been from LDS people. Not, not outsiders, not the federal government, right? So and should we get rid of, because we started talking about the policy, do we need yeah. to get rid of the polygamy policy? Oh, gosh, I don't, I don't know what to say. I'm, this is why I'm not in charge. This is why I was never meant to be a god, because I'm not a celestial person. I don't know how to, I don't know how to handle that one. But I, I will tell you this. A 
century of secrecy and hiding these documents. And, you know, ex-Mormons are always like, the church is hiding the history from us. And it's like, yes, it's true, and but not for the reasons you think. Like, they're not doing it to lie to you. They don't want you to become a fundamentalist. That's why we don't talk about Adam God, because if you read it, the logical conclusion is like, well, then why aren't we doing this? And that's what happens all the time. Well, and I asked David Patrick and Benjamin Schaefer, um, is, is Adam God the gateway drug to polygamy? And they said, yes, it was. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and, and the majority of these fundamental modern day prophets are former seminary teachers, institute teachers, and mission presidents. Because they're guys that have a little bit of free time on their, they're not in the quorum high enough that they don't have any time to research. They're in there that they want to be wise and counsel people. And you stumble up across this doctrine and you can't deny it. And I often say ex-Mormons are the same as Mormon fundamentalists. They're still all Mormon. Mm. <laughs> what happens is you have a faith crisis and you either say, well, the church lied to me for this reason or the church lied to me for this reason. And that's really the only difference. And, and of course, I'm just being silly, but like mostly that's what it is. Um, fundamentalists are the most ex-Mormon and also the most Mormon. Like they're the most Mormon, right? But they're also ex-Mormon and... And one of the critiques that I give the ex-Mormon community at Sunstone, we validate them as a valid Mormon path because, again, this is a bias heavily in our community. Mormon scholars don't want to pay attention to ex-Mormons because they're like, oh, they're just angry. Of course they're angry. They, they went through a terrible experience. On the spectrum of Mormonism, they were over here. Of course they're angry. Stop telling them to not be. And when people leave the FLDS church, we're all like, oh, of course, you've been through so much. Good for you. Your marriage fell apart, but good for you. Of course it did. But when LDS people leave the church and their marriage falls apart, we're like, well, what's wrong with you? Why can't you get it together? And it's just, it depends on where you're at in that spectrum. It's just hard. And I just think that we, we have to look at this. We have a collective reckoning. There was a wound created, arguably, when the church stepped away from polygamy. It, it is vibrating still. And I... Of course, no one is responsible for Warren Jeffs' actions except for Warren Jeffs. But I'm also, in the work that I do, I look at systems, not people. I always say, you know, Christine Hagelin and Joanna Brooks gave me this phrase, which is hard on systems, soft on people. And that's what, I, that's what I do. And I have the same sympathy for the brethren in our church. They are part of a system. I don't know how to handle this question. Because you do. If you... Because we don't want... I, mean, I totally understand where the brethren are coming from. Mm -hmm. We don't want people saying, oh, go join the LDS church so you can come back to us. I mean, I don't, well, I don't and, want to and be part of that. Here's the thing. This is the, back to my critique with ex-Mormons. I always say, guys, like, ex-Mormons watch conference more religiously than, like, faithful Mormons do. They'll watch it, and they'll give you a play-by-play, -play and they'll be like, can you believe that Elder Holland said this? And then they'll all rant about it. And I'm like, guys, like, you're still sustaining the brethren. You just don't agree with them. That's the difference. Like, you're still upholding their authority. They still matter to you. And that's okay. Like, we need to stop being ashamed of that. Of course they impact our, our lives. Of course things that they say are going to affect you and your family. Like, why are we so afraid to admit that? That's the, the hierarchy's narrative, that you're with us or against us. And they created that because that's what they do, to consolidate their power so they can maintain leadership. It makes sense. But ex-Mormons give the Mormon church power every time that they they validate the authority of the brethren, even if they don't believe in the divinity You'll of them. see these memes uh, heard on Sunday where they usually put a meme of some general authority, which is highly out of context, but just for shock value. And I, I just, so and, and so you're saying the they're still sustaining the boat? Of course the they are, because here's what I've learned. This is the, the gift that Mormon fundamentalists have, have given me. And this is why they're so dangerous. This is why all the policies in the LDS Church reflect being afraid of them instead of the John DeLynn types, right? People, they actually don't care that much about liberal Mormons. You, cut out, you excommunicated Kate Kelly, the movement sort of dies down, right? I mean, that's not what it happens, but it's an easier thing than fundamentalism because fundamentalism is a harder thing to root out. It can be on your benches and pews, and you don't even know about it, and it is. I, just last week, there's there, just so you know, who's ever in charge of the Boise, you Idaho... Because the fundamentalists and then you start a new religion. They don't even care about your authority anymore. And they're still doing it anyway. They don't, they don't give an F about who Elder Holland is. They don't even know who Elder Holland is. So, like, Elder Holland says something and they're like, 
I don't care. We're going to do Mormonism our own way. They are not listening, upholding the authority, and yet they're still so very Mormon. Their Mormonism is almost identical to our Mormonism in practice, culture, and theology. What a scary thing. There's, they have no power there, and that's why I tell ex-Mormons, like, if you really don't want the church to have a power there, you have to figure out a way to stop organizing around what they're saying. <laughs> because it's, and, and, and I'm you not saying that as an accusation. <laughs> well, I, honestly, I don't, I have this belief that once a Mormon, always a Mormon. I just do. I think it's, it's a doctrine that's full immersion, and it seeps into your bones. Like, like I think Joanna Brooks says, it doesn't wash off. It doesn't. And so there will be generations of us that are affected by this always. I used to say, we're broken. We're broken forever. And someone's like, don't frame it that way. So I like to say we're affected. We will be affected. And my kids, I'm not raising in the church. That was a conscious decision. But they will be affected by the generational trauma of me, right? So they're being raised by, <laughs> by Mormon activists. And I was just making this joke that we need to, like, crowdfund for all the therapy for the children of Mormon activists. Because they're getting a whole different kind of crazy Mormon experience. But we're all tied together. We're Mormon through and through. And that's why it's really informed my work at Sunstone, more than one way to Mormon. I'm not saying that as, like, a little tagline. I'm saying it because it's honest. Yeah. It's honest. It's the truest thing that I can come up with and in the most integrity with what I do. I used to obsess like, oh, should I do an interview and wear sleeves because what if they see that I'm not wearing my garments anymore and then they'll know that my voice doesn't have credibility and I'm like, that's nonsense. I'm not going to play into that power dynamic and yet so many people do. Scholars still, they can't make the LDS church mad because then we don't have power and I thought, you're just giving them power. You're just upholding a toxic narrative. The only way through this, I think, is to let every Mormon own who they are and live Mormonism the way that they do and accept that and stop trying to say, but this one's the more true church and this one, that's where we get into trouble. That's where I think that people, that lives start to be damaged. Well, and I know that, I know, especially with your work here at Sunstone, that you've actually gone out of your way to try to because I know Sunstone has been marginalized for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I know you've really tried to bring in, you know, BYU professors and yeah. church employees. Oh, um, I played that game for a long time because people were like, oh, Lindsay, like, Sunstone's just too anti-Mormon, so you need to bring them in. And I was like, oh, you're right. We'll solve that. We'll just invite more faithful Mormon voices. And they all told me no. And I was like, So when Wait people complain that Sunstone's too one-sided... Come. No, here's the thing. You can complain all day that Sunstone's too fringe. And I say yes, exactly. But at least we're honest. Because here's the thing. Every Mormon knows how to perform Mormonism. We all know how to go to Sunday and put on the costume, the outfit, the white shirt, and the tie, and say the right things. We perform Mormonism, and then we go home and we think whatever we think, and we do whatever we do. And listen, in my job, I hear everyone's secrets, so all y'all are into some weird stuff, and you all have your secrets. And that's okay. That's, that's called being human. But the difference is, is like Sunstone is, we stop running away from that. People are like, oh, you're fringe. Like, and I was like, yes, and so are you but we're not ashamed of it here. And that's, that's how I got around from that, the toxic faith politics that I've seen destroy families. It faith destroyed politics, my own family. Faith politics, where we have to pretend and perform our, our loyalty to the institution. Because in Mormonism, proximity to power is how we gain our own power, because there can only be one guy. There's only one prophet. So your power and your credibility and your worth is in proximity to that one guy, right? So we all organize around that in different ways. It's damaging. It's cankering to the soul. Because what we are saying is we are giving someone else the authority over our worth, our worthiness, our heaven, our God, our connection, our interaction with the divine. And I'm not going to do it anymore. I did that for years. I believed that was the way to go. And I can't with integrity do that anymore. I love Mormonism. I have such affection to it. And honestly, for better or for worse, I actually don't like this about myself. I'm loyal to it through and through. Obviously, as my work is a testament to, I'm loyal to it. But I'm loyal to it collectively. I, I will never give my, my own personal authority to any dude again. It's too complicated. It's too messy. There's too much paperwork, too many stories. There's no value in that. And I can see that time and time again. When Mormonism has become performed loyalty over connection with the divine, then it's not interesting to me. 
So at Sunstone, that's what we do. We embrace the fringe. We allow all different kinds of Mormons to come. And that's a difficult thing to do because I have to confront a shared connection with someone who I find their ideas repulsive. I find their practices repulsive. I find some of their ways of thinking or their lifestyles repulsive. And I don't want to, I don't want to see any connectivity between us, right? But that's dishonest. There's always connectivity somewhere, and especially in Mormonism, we have this shared faith. And, and so that's what I say, like, we're dishonest. That's all. So church employees are welcome at Sunstone? They come. To present especially? A lot of them, a lot of them have, we give them fake names on their name tags and all that. Because <laughs> I, I don't mean to make, you know, I get all passionate about this, but like the reality is there are live consequences for people. Right. But I think every time that we play into that, we're uh, making it worse for them, not better. And so, but, you know, yeah, we have. But you would, you would personally like to see more church employees, people from the Joseph Smith Papers, wherever, uh, BYU, to, to present, right? If it's it not that you're them, shutting them down I don't, at all. Here's the thing. I'm done playing the game. I don't need them to give us legitimacy. People wrote out Sunstone as a legitimate LDS thing years ago. They, they want to say that that's under my tenure or, you know, we've dumbed it down or whatever. And I'm like, honey, that, that ship left way before when the organization in 1991, when the LDS church came out with a statement against Symposia, they didn't say Sunstone, but, I mean, everyone used that. We became the hard surface for people to strike against to, like, perform their Mormonism. Look how righteous I am. I'm not going there. You were the crazy fundamentalist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I see, I know what that, the effect is. I, there's a suicide a week in Colorado City right now. A suicide a week from young boys. I lost one of my dear friends where we just a suicide. I'm kind of angry about it. Like, as long as we continue to marginalize people and say, like, oh, but they're not the real Mormons. They're not. When we, when we do that, we play those faith politics and we say who's in or who's out. We want to say, well, it's just about the church. It doesn't matter. When you are coming at people's Mormon identity, you're coming at who they are, what formed them. And scholars and theologians and all these people trying to cater to the LDS church, I get it. I, I'm sympathetic. I wanted their approval for so long. I wanted... All it took for me at Ordained Women is, you, you know, just have Elder Nelson come out and pat me on the head and be like, Lindsay, we see you. You're so special. And I've been like, I'll turn away from you, all my feminist sisters, because I finally got my validation. And that's what it's about. They're never going to give us what we want, institutional validation. And we all want that because we were groomed to want that. It is impossible. They can't do it. The church is too big. So... We need to be coming up with healthier ways, but we all play these games. We all want the church to recognize us. If Sunstone has more faithful scholars, then we'll be important. And I just want people to talk about interesting things in Mormonism. I don't care if you think it's legitimate or not. I had a very prominent Mormon scholar say, oh, no offense, but I won't come to, you, to Sunstone because I'm interested in legitimate Mormon experiences. And you're talking about polyamory, and, you know, it's just... I'm really interested in moving the needle for legitimate Mormon experiences. And I thought, huh, that's so interesting that, like, what's legitimate? And he was like, well, you know, faithful LDS. And I thought, do you, do you not know that polyamory is a part of my like, faithful LDS experience? Like, that's what people are doing. I know, I know, I feel like I'm gifted in the sense, so blessed that I get to see what the real Mormons are like. And they take all the costumes off, right? And... I love them anyway, and I think it's a cancer in, in our community. I think, uh, I think there's a lot of Mormons that are still, that will hide under scholarship to try to get institutional validation, and I sympathize with it. I f kind of feel sorry for it. They're the little Lindsay that needs the head pat, right? Oh, I changed the church. Look at how my, I, you know, I have a citation in one of the essays. I finally made a difference to my people. And I don't think it's that hard. I think we just have to start accepting people for who they are. If you want to make a difference to people, if you want to do something radical, stop playing into those apostate narratives that we inherited from a long time ago. Because they're, they're just toxic, and they're so stupid. And you can see it so clearly in the FLDS with their apostate rhetoric and who's in and who's out. And we want it, and we can see it in them, but we can't look at our, at our own lives. And I don't know. I think that's what this work does, is it's a call to hold up a mirror. Mm-hmm.
So uh, as, as we conclude here, the one last question I want to ask you, I know you said you've been really trying to help, help with uh, FLDS communities and so is there a website or do you have uh, crowdsourcing yeah, so I, or anything that people can learn more and help out if they want to? I started what's called the Fern Foundation, which is a nonprofit where we go. The Fern Foundation? Fern. Isn't that? Fern. Oh, Fern. Yeah. Because I was like, that's Rodney Meldrum, isn't no, it? No, there's a, there's a play on words there, but no, the Fern as a new growth, the consistent growth, um, hardy growth. We go down twice a year, uh, April and October, and we do a service project. We just bring a lot of outsiders into the town, and we do we rent out a big plug house. All our volunteers stay there, and then we like, you know, we've we've done a lot of things. We had held the first rally against FLDS police at the time five years ago, which was phenomenal. We've changed Warren Justice Compound into the Dream Center. We've helped the Dream Center change it into like a rehab center. Uh, we're helping Cherish Families. Uh, that's another organization that I would encourage people to support. So if you want to help with that, you can donate to that, uh, fernfoundation.org. We go in twice a year. It's really fun. You can sign up for our projects, and it's kind of an adventure. Uh, we're working on getting a community nature center. That's our new focus, and so the Fern Foundation is going to slowly be um, absorbed into the Short Creek Community Nature Center, um, but we're a ways from that. But that's what Fern Foundation does. But if you want to help directly and not have me be the intermediary, go to Cherish Families. Cherish Families is run by former people in the town. They, uh, to me, no organization is perfect by any means, but they are trying to help the town and their people that are grew up in the town and understand the culture and understand sort of the challenges. And Shirley Draper, she's was a plural wife that left. Uh, she's a Mormon feminist, she's amazing. Atheist woman, went to the U, got her master's degree, in social work and came back and is helping our community. She runs Cherished Families. So they give counseling and therapy and they, they, they just got uh, a new dentist's office and um, they're getting a doctor's office put in town and things like that. So Cherished Families is, is a great organization and those are just some ways. There's a lot of organizations that are trying to help rescue people from polygamy. I've sort of turned away from the rescue dynamic. I think that there's something really insulting as I've seen my FLDS people struggle in the outside world to like assume that the outside world is better. Like, we're gonna rescue you to our life. My life's a mess, but come over to my way of thinking. So yeah, I'm more interested in helping just walk with people in their struggle, so. All right. Well, Lindsay Hanson Park, I really appreciate you for spending so much time here on Gospel Tangents. We might have to get you on again though. Yeah, sorry, I just ranted at you for oh, that's like. That's great, that's great. Anytime you wanna rant, I'm your girl. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, Lindsay. I really yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Lindsay Hanson Park. And if you haven't checked out her podcast, Year of Polygamy, you're really missing out. So, she, like I said, she doesn't just do polygamy, although obviously that's a big thing, but she talks about other things as well. So, Lindsay, thank you so much. And uh, I also want to tell everybody um, to please, as long as we're not under quarantine, please go to Sunstone at the end of last week of July here in Salt Lake City. I'd love to see you. Lindsay would love to see you. Hopefully we're not under quarantine by then, but uh, hopefully you can see us here at Sunstone. Uh, please come see me as well as you can say hi to Lindsay, although I know she's going to be super busy. So just come see me. Um, but anyway, Sunstone's awesome and you should uh, check that out. Our next conversation is going to be with uh, Bill Shepard. He's an amazing historian from a church whose name you might find very familiar. It, it's actually the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Strangite. <laughs> so that was, we had to put the appendage on. That we couldn't use the term Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for obvious reasons. <laughs> so you've got, in fact, I think the only difference between your church name and my church name is I have a lowercase d and you've got a capital D with no hyphen. Right. And we have a hyphen right. lowercase. So that, that's pretty funny. So would you call yourself a Mormon? Oh, very definitely. Um... If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe to patreon.com slash gospel tangents. And for just $5 a month, you can hear the entire interview without any interruption. If you'd like a paperback version of our transcripts, go to amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents interview. Also, if you'd like to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website and I'll be able to send you a transcript as soon as they are completed and click the subscribe button. You can also find our latest information on facebook.com slash gospel tangents, as well as we're on Twitter at gospel tangents. 
And don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. The link is at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents, and you can subscribe there. Also, please give us a five-star review. If you want to support all of the podcasts as part of the Dialogue Podcast Network, Go to lyceum.fm, that's L-Y-C-E-U-M dot F-M, and do a search for Dialogue Podcast Network or Gospel Tangents, because, you know, that's a pretty cool one, too. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got some of our great videos. Thanks again.